Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's BISC brief for our December. We're in December, December 5th, 2019. Uh, today, we're going to talk about privacy protecting growth strategies. Um, growth is something that we haven't really been pushing too hard over the past several months. Um, mainly, so the early part of the year in April was the Dow launch, and uh, we were a little hesitant to push the push growth uh, with with that big change coming. Um, beforehand, we didn't want, or at least I didn't want new people to, you know, just become introduced to BISC and then all of a sudden see this token and this Dow and all this stuff come up, kind of uh, disillusioning or maybe unsettle people a little bit who don't know the software or the project that well. Um, and then after that, after the Dow launch, of course, there was the risk that the Dow launch did not go very well. It did, but it, there was a chance that it didn't and that there were bugs and that uh, there would have been issues there. And then also right around the time of the Dow launch, there was uh, an issue with scammers. And so there was a little bit of uncertainty uh, over the security of the network and pushing for new users at that point didn't just didn't make any sense. And so uh, those issues were uh, seemingly resolved with uh, 1.2 release a few weeks ago. Uh, we've been refining that release ever since. We actually just uh, 10 minutes ago, I think, just launched 1.2.4, which was a big bug fix release. Uh, you can see more in the release notes, but it uh, did a lot of refinement, uh, squashing bugs. Uh, one of the main benefits that you'll probably see in the UI as a user is that uh, account age for risky payment accounts is now shown again as it was before. So I think with 1.2, age was hidden and you just saw the, the signing uh, details. But with 1.2.4, 1, 1 you'll see the, the age as well as the signing for some additional perspective on the account that you're dealing with. So, yeah, that's some background on growth uh, so far this year and why it's been a little bit, um, I don't know the right word, we kind of haven't been too intentional with pushing this growth too hard. But I think now is a good time going into the new year with the new release and uh, what, I th what I think is a safer network, um, better primed to handle new users. And yeah, it's also good to see you guys on the call. I think. Uh, in addition to you folks and, and people watching on the, the YouTube stream afterward, we've had a good, what looks like a good stream of people interested in growth and marketing and communication become involved with the project recently. So it's a great time. Uh, I think the project itself is ready for this stuff and um, it looks like it's attracting people who can help put this, uh, this, uh, this uh, initiative in motion. So uh, it's great to see that. Let me share my screen to give you an idea of what I have in mind to cover. Uh, just one slide. I want to, uh, where is the button? I just want to give a little bit of structure to the call so we're not all over the place. Share. And, oh boy. Oh, one second. Uh, yeah, okay. Share screen. If you don't see that, let me know. But you should see, uh, you should see one slide with a couple of, of talking points. So to start, I guess uh, to continue with uh, what I was saying, I want to welcome new contributors. Anybody who's on this call or watching afterward, uh, welcome. Uh, growth is a is an area that we could certainly use more support across the different functions and ways that we do it. Um, some of those I've listed below. So um, we'll go through those in a, in a moment. But um, I guess about about onboarding. So welcome to everybody who is new. I know that starting to contribute to BISC is not the easiest thing in the world. I think that's something that we could do a little bit better. We had uh, a one guy join recently who, uh, who started to do a lot of stuff and uh, it seemed really uh, proactive and 
you know, good intentions and, um, but he, the way he was doing things was a little bit new or confusing to me. And, uh, I kind of took it the wrong way and, uh, ended up in a discussion with this guy. And it turns out that, you know, he was just doing things the way he thought was the right way to do things. Um, the conventions of contributing to BISC are not so clear. So I think that's a thing that we could do better. Um, but I will say that on, on your end as a contributor, one thing that you can do to really uh, help with the uncertainty is just keep people informed of what you're doing, what's on your mind. If you have an idea to uh, help the network, uh, whether it's a growth idea or uh, a feature you want to see in the software or a translation you want to see or a payment method you want to see added, whatever it is, just post the idea in in our key based channel or on GitHub or somewhere where the idea can be publicly evaluated and discussed. And uh, that, that not only helps refine what your idea is, but it also uh, gets other people in the project aware of what you're doing so that when it comes time to make a compensation request, um, that people aren't blindsided by it and, you know, just wonder where, where this come from? What is this? Um, so it's just good for everybody involved. Um, and ideas for, for helping onboarding to help make that process better are, of course, appreciated. I'm not sure it makes sense to talk about that on this call unless you guys have uh, particular ideas already in mind. Um, but yeah, what I wanted to focus on were, were the, the, the bottom three points of what I see as the, the main avenues for growth that can be refined and, and optimized. So the funnel, uh, the software itself, and publicity around the project. So, um, yeah, I think it's attractive to think of growth, or at least I tend to think of growth as just this one big blob of things that, that, th that need to happen, but it's helpful to segment them out and really understand what these, the different parts of this uh, initiative are. And, um, you know, you as contributors can uh, th think of, it, make it easier for you as contributors to think of where you fit, where you may fit in best and where you may be able to contribute the most um, to help out. So for the first item, uh, and these are listed in no particular order, but um, I guess we can address, address the funnel first since that's listed first. Um, so I think of this as the, the full process of when someone learns about this to their you know, initial interactions, going to the website, um, of course, SEO, finding the website in the first place, whether that's through social or through search, and then going to the site, uh, having some kind of conversion. So you know, ideally downloading the software and then, um, and then actually using it. So there's kind of, I guess you could say a funnel on getting someone to download the software on the website and then within the software itself uh actually getting someone to to make a trade so i i can't tell you the number of people i've met who download the software i think it's really cool but then open it up and like just don't do anything with it they just don't know what to do um so i guess that's kind of kind of uh, continuing on to the second point of the software and optimizing that to, to make it as approachable as possible. But um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of going through this fast. Does anybody have any, any ideas so far, maybe on the funnel side of it on SEO? So Ricardo, I don't know if he's on the call, but Ricardo made some recent pull requests on SEO um, that, that I merged that I mean, fairly simple, what I would think of as low hanging fruit, just adding the uh, structured data that Google can use to make more optimized search results. So for example, one of the ones he added was a, um, some markup on the FAQ, the frequently asked questions page, where you know, now, or maybe in a couple of days when Google uh, has crawled the updated FAQ page, when someone searches for stuff that's on the fact page, it'll show in Google as a, um, like as a question block. So you don't just see the search yeah, result in text, answer. you also see like a bit of an expanded card view that people can engage with uh, a little bit better. 
So that was a simple markup that, you know, that he, that he put in that I didn't know about, but um, will, you know, hopefully increase the SEO results of, uh, of the BISC website. So if anybody has any ideas on like SEO and like improving that further, um, that, that'd be something we could do. I mean, that's, you know, I think that just requires so know-how. Things to add. So first of all, uh, I, together with Wiz, I, I am one of the people who have access to the Matomo instance, which is our analytics, Google analytics, sort of. It's, yep. a, it's an open source version of it that is privacy focused. And the traffic to the website is pretty constant. And also, I, I believe that what we see is a very small sample because our users are very privacy aware. And I bet, I, I would bet a lot of money that 80% of them use ad blockers. So they would be blocking this tracking. But the, the traffic is pretty constant. And even though when we make um, media appearances like the Tales from the Crick, uh, crypt uh, podcast or the Stefan Levera podcast still the traffic in the website doesn't change much so that leads me to think that the the people going to our website they already know about us they've known about us for quite a while and they just go to the website whenever they need to reinstall this or they, they just downloading stuff every now and then so it, it leads me to think that we have a good brand equity like people are aware of what BISC is, but they don't really take action. Like a lot of people download, like, like Steve said, but a lot more people know about it, but they never ventured to, to go through it. And that's where we, we could think of ways of incentivizing that or figuring out ways to communicate that better because BISC seems to be just like the, I don't know, join market where it sounds like a great idea. Everybody likes it, but very few people actually use it. So this is the real challenge we have. Yeah. When you say don't go through it, are you, are you talking about they don't, they don't go through or it doesn't seem like they're going through downloading it or they're not going through actually using it once they have downloaded it? You I think know? there's two. So like, first of all, the traffic to the website, we have less than a thousand visits per day, but at least tracked visits. Yeah. So I, I think that would be some 20% of people actually visiting because the other 80 would probably be using ad blockers, but I just can't tell from the metrics. And then once it is downloaded, because it is a peer to peer program and well, especially the newer generation, they're used to web services where everything is solved for you and you just create an account and start using this uh, mental model of peer to peer software is is very foreign to people. So they're used to, they're not used to, I don't know, file sharing like Napster, Kazaa, or all the old stuff. People who lived in the internet in the 90s and early 2000s know a lot about. New people don't know about UX wise. Right, right. Yeah, so I, Pedro just dropped off the call, but I think he, um, I think he holds a key to a lot of this because I don't know if you guys saw, he had some, um, some mock-ups for a new interface for the BISC software. Uh, and one of the key elements of that, of those mock-ups were a, a wizard to guide people. Like when they first opened the software, what mm -hmm. should they do? And he had very specific, like, you know, make an account. And it was like a, a screen by screen, one step at a time. How do you do that? And then once you have that done, make an offer. You know, don't look at the offer book and get disappointed at the liquidity. Make an offer because there are a lot of people lurking that will probably take your offer if you mm -hmm. make a good one. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. That's also the, the feedback that I heard from last week. Uh, not last week, but a few days ago, I recorded a podcast with some of the Brazilian guys. And this was exactly the feedback that one of them gave me. He's like, hey, why don't we have a wizard in this to make it useful, like easier for, to onboard new people? And new people in both senses of the word, right? Newer, younger people and <laughs> new to the application. Yeah. But I think on the other hand, on the site itself, we have a very good website for an open source project. 
but it's not so welcoming for people who just want to be users. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the website, we have like a, a clear text saying, oh, this is a decentralized exchange, but it's not really a selling page. So I think we could experiment with having specific landing pages where we, we link to. The hard thing is because we don't have paid media, we can't divert people directly to these pages, but it could be something that we experiment by, for example, switching the homepage uh, for a couple of weeks to a page that is way more focused on explaining what it is and, and calling to action to download and then reverting afterwards because we don't really know what's, what's ideal. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly be open to experimenting with uh, other designs for the, for the front page. I mean, I, personally, one of the things that attracted me to the project way back when I found out about it at the end of uh, 2017, before the redesign, was the, uh, how do I put this well, like the, 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 the ugliness of the website appealed to me. Like it just, it just seemed kind of more honest in a way. Um, yeah, well, the that's the site. open source side of it, right? Yeah, just like, like it was, when you're it used was, to going through open source websites, you're used to that because you see that the, the, the sweat and tears are actually going into the code and not into the promotion of it. Yeah, well, I mean, and I, that's not to take away from, I mean, the site looks great right now, but I think it could be a little bit more direct, kind of maybe what you were saying, like what you were saying is just make it more focused on take, people taking action and downloading the software as opposed to explaining it and like having all that marketing there. Yeah, we could also test that in a few markets mm -hmm. and, and see how that goes. Like that's not a, a whole lot of work to do. Like right now we have about 10 to 12% conversion rate of mm -hmm. well, on tracked people. Like I don't know the, the people with ad blockers. So from a hundred people that fall into the website, 10 will, will download at least one version of the software. Wow. And it, it's pretty interesting that most of them is Windows. And then second is Mac, but there are many days where there's more Linux downloads than Mac. So yeah. overall, Mac is, is above Linux, but many days Linux beats Mac, which is pretty unusual. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the aggregate numbers, the, the number of, I think for the recent, most recent month when I did the numbers, it was, it was very close. The Linux, if you combine the Linux with the, uh, like the Debian with the uh, RPM, then it was very close overall to the Mac. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's interesting. Um. Yeah, but also offsite, we, we need to figure out ways to get people to download because I feel like people know about this, but they never ventured inside of it. So the podcast that you and, and Wiz have been doing, that creates a lot of awareness about BISC, but we need to get the second step. You know, After awareness, they need to do some action and, and get to the website, like some real interest. Because also I feel like we get a lot of users whenever like coins get delisted, delisted from the, the exchange they use, like OKX, I think it was today they delisted Monero. Mm -hmm. so, I think we're going to get a lot of Monero people joining in because of that. So people see BISC as the plan B and because they were ever aware of it, they only go to it when shit hits the fan. Right. Right. Yeah. Hmm. And I think this is also when we started discussing on GitHub, the referrals. So referrals are a tricky thing to do, especially in an environment like BISC, where we don't have any tracking. So neither the app, like the app doesn't have any tracking at all. Right. Like the only thing that is tracked is by the, the peer nodes that they, they look at the order book and the, I don't know, like some very basic transactional things. So they can't really tell, like for all the purposes of our referral program, it's pretty useless. And so we were discussing about, I, I propose to have a very simple referral where we would just uh, agree with some larger 
uh, content producers a, a fixed rate, whatever. So like for for a US download, we're gonna pay you two BSQs and and settle every end of the month. And and that's just the the way we can do it. Like we're gonna have a lot of fraud with that, but the, the way is to tweak the price down and and try to have the people have skin in the game in the BSQ, not to to issue too much to to completely inflate it. Yeah, it's tricky with uh, referrals. Uh... Yeah, I even spoke to to Stefan Oliveira if what what he thinks about the idea, and he's a tricky thing is that because we have a token. And tokens got such a bad name in the in the street. Right. He said, "Man, I wouldn't do it because it it's it feels like I'm pump, pumping a token, and that's <laughs> not yeah. the image I want to have." Right. And I said, "Well, that's a very fair point because we do have a a token to to be able to do the voting and to distribute the the rev the, the compensation. It it is very tricky." So then I told him, what if we do it like payment of Bitcoin and then it becomes just such a daisy chaining of, of ifs, right? So, yeah. And also, I don't know. I, I mean, I love the idea of referrals. They sound like they could be very effective, but I just, when I think about where I've seen referral links, they just almost always come across as spammy. I, at least in because my Because you never noticed the ones on Medium. Oh, okay, like in like in blog posts and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of those have it. That's fair. Yeah, so I guess there is a good way to do it, but I don't know. It's it's tricky. Um, yeah. So another way is to actually buy media. So we go to a you know, coin market cap. Yeah. Place an insert insertion order. The tricky thing is that to buy media in these guys, either you go directly to them. And, and pay, I think the minimum is like 50K dollars to have a bunch of impressions on the website, which sucks. But I remember back at my, my previous job at, a, at an agency, I was running some experiments buying media at a fraction of a cent in a bunch of crypto websites that they put up their inventory for exchange bidding. Mm -hmm. So it was, easy to get the hard part is the how do we settle payments on that because at this agency i just had a deal with the the owner that i would pay him back like out of my salary mm -hmm. so to do something on behalf of bisc it's a bit more tricky so either somebody needs to constantly be doing that and then how do you how do you do that do we send a reimbursement proposal to the dao like do we even want to do that because this is display advertising and it's super like even though you can select the websites there is a lot of fraud involved as well so what it is you, very yeah. what do you think about the uh the, so the, the way I, I don't know you know a lot more about marketing than i do but what do you think about the effectiveness of of a robust content campaign so i think one thing we've been lacking on is blogging and mm -hmm. two videos and i think those two in particular if done well should be able to have quite a bit of traffic generation and attention yeah so i noticed that the videos whenever we have local people doing videos about this mm -hmm. they get pretty well spread around their community but i I fail to see how we can, so like content marketing in general, you need to have like something specific to talk about. I think in our case, one uh, topic is always like whenever somebody gets delisted, we just say, just like in proof of keys where we have Tango down and we, we shame them to hell, we could shame an exchange to say, oh man, like <laughs> you, you delisted Monero. What the hell are you doing? Yeah. And, and ride that wave. But that's a very reactive and very, like you need to be very fast. So we need to be very, very fast at creating these blog posts and creating these memes and spreading them around. But as, as an overall content strategy, 
like the more content we create, the more we're going to index for other related things like decentralized exchanges, how to get your first Bitcoin, how does this work? But then it becomes really hard to make distinguishing content about Bitcoin in general. Right. So the, the content that is everlasting, we, we pretty much have it, which is how to trade on BISC, how to do these things. So I don't know how effective that would be in getting people to, to link to us or so, to yeah. link. No, but just to, to come to our website, you know, because it's not like you go to Unchained Capital, for example, their, their series on, well, how's it called? Uh, gradually, then suddenly. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting uh, series and it is about pure economics and it's the it's a guy it's the owner of the company who's writing that and like writing very unique pieces of content like thought leadership type of stuff where we get people to to talk about us and be mentioned all around yeah i'm sure we could so, think of i'm sure we could think of unique content worth publishing. I was actually just thinking, I was, I was talking to someone yesterday who uh, was suggesting that we take the social side of what BISC is doing and turn that into a content strategy. He was actually suggesting to do a, a whole podcast on it, like, like a BISC mm -hmm. podcast. Just have a series with people like um, the Human Rights Foundation guy, uh, I forget his name. Um, mm -hmm. There's a uh, yeah, but just have like a, have a talk with him. Have a talk with people around the world who are you know in different countries uh, and their experience with the trading experience on the ground and how this has been helpful for them. You know, Africa. Yeah, but you see, America. this is more of an re-engagement type of thing. It's for people who already use this, no? I think it could be both. I think it, it could be great for people who don't quite grasp what BISC is all about. If they hear a podcast or two about one of these use cases, then, you know, maybe it sparks the imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't really agree with that. I think because the podcast is something you subscribe to, and it, at, at least I, the way I hear podcasts and the people I know hear podcasts is they subscribe to one and they stick to it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they go podcast hunting for a topic and they end up buying it. I think this could be a, a cool thing to be engaging the community and having updates about it. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how that would get us new users. At least I see that being much more effective done by local content producers. Mm -hmm. Sort of like we have now, but in a bit more coordinated way. Like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I recorded now with the Brazilian guys that, and they are much better at coordinating locally than I am. Mm -hmm. And we did a, a tutorial that's going to go live, I think, next Thursday, 12. Yeah, next Thursday. Okay. So we could either try to gather all these guys in one place to talk only about BISC, but I think then we're only going to get the really hardcore BISC fans and not the casual, the most casual users. Well, that's possible. I would say that it's, I mean, BISC, the BISC community has, has grown tremendously. And I think um, the, the reach that it has, the people who are following the project is, is now much, it's gone further beyond just the people who are using it and just the people who are, you know, really fanatical about it. I mean, you know, I, I look, I've looked at the, um, some of the top followers of, of BISC and some of the places it's been picked up and I don't know I think you know when we we put out blog posts and videos in the past they've been commented on and spread uh, well beyond the user base but I don't know it's possible I mean, you're, you're, you know mm -hmm. I think you're right but I think there's also a chance maybe we just have to test this and see what happens like put out a few pieces of content and see how far it goes but I think the reach I think the reach has grown pretty, pretty well. Yeah, somebody posted here in the chat about partnering with BTC Pay Server. Uh, I know that there is one contributor. So 
uh, in BTC Pay Server, there's Cooks. Uh, I know him personally, and he he worked on the BTC Pay transmuter, which is their Zapier or if this then that engine within BTC Pay Server. And I know there is one BIS contributor. Uh, his first name failed me. He's from Poland. Hmm. Oh crap! I met him in the Honey Badger. Forgot his first name. So he he actually he was working on the API to enable exactly that, but that that depends on getting the API implemented because then BTC Pay Server can talk to BISC and create the orders. So it's not a matter of wanting; it's a matter of uh, getting there. And and BTC Pay Server, the guys are super open. They they will certainly put it up there in the in the transmuter page and all that stuff. And, and they are all they all use BISC. Like Nicolas Dorier is one of the C nodes right. for BTC, right? Uh, I think okay. I signed some some commit. Okay. But anyways, they they are very close to the project and they they like BISC. So yeah. when that is ready, I'm pretty sure that will happen. Yeah, actually, partnerships in general is a, is a kind of a cool idea. BTC Pay and I think even Wasabi, those two projects could be very good fits. And I've seen, um, I've actually seen contributors come and go, or at least people who've had previous involvement with both both projects. So I don't know what the exact uh, tie-in could be, but. Um, Oh yeah, Pedro. I just wanted to say we. Uh, I think you dropped out for a second, but we had, we'd been talking about your uh, mockups for new interface for the software, and how uh, it'd be really nice to have a wizard, some kind of a step by step guide for people to become productive with the software soon after getting it. So you mean it would be nice to have it, or yeah. I mean I think in the last mockups I've added, it already includes the wizard. Yeah, yeah, no, I, was, I, I like what you've mocked up. I think it'd be great to have that implemented. I think, uh, I think it would help people become, you know, help with their confusion when they first download it. Yeah, I'm also, I also re, restarted the, a little bit of a project of doing it like a presentation explainer video. Mm -hmm. that I'll be presenting in the next couple of weeks. Oh, cool. So like, uh, do you, you have, have it on Keepbase? I can't find a go? design channel. Excuse me? Yeah. Do you have it on Keybase somewhere? I can't find the design channel. There. Uh, yeah, there is a design channel there. I can see it. Oh, there is a design channel, but I think those there it is, yeah. might have 16 been on members. Slack. Let me copy the link over. Come on, no more Slack, guys. Yeah, this is a while ago. Here, design. Found it. Yeah, well, I don't, there's no files shared there. Or maybe there was a folder. I'm saying there's a problem displaying this prototype. Yeah. I got it here. Okay. One second. Yeah, well, I don't see anything here. We can figure that out later. Where, yeah, where yeah. the mockups are. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I can't really talk because I'm at work. I was just listening in. Okay. Uh, sure. That's fine. No problem. Yeah, and then I guess so, the other, other idea I had for the software itself was. Um, so in addition to having some kind of wizard or some kind of uh, yeah, some kind of guide step by step like uh, Pedro had proposed, I think it would also be very helpful to have links, documentation, and other helpful maybe helpful videos uh, to help people to help explain some of the concepts that people are most often confused by. Right now, there is no integration between the software and all the resources to help you use the software. And that's, I think, fairly simple. Just put links wherever they're needed. I don't know if that's something people would find interest, find helpful. It seems like something relatively easy that we could do to help. To help.
Yeah, the software itself is very tricky to, to do usability tests. It's not like you can just buy a bunch of random users on usertest.com and have them go through it. Yeah, but maybe that's an idea for, uh, for a meetup or an event. Like just have, uh, you know, four or five people open up BISC for the first time and then just observe, observe see what they do and what they're uh, actually doing. what if we indeed do that like we buy 10 users on on some of these websites to see what they, well first of all i don't know how we can refine these uh, whenever we do these requests but to see what people think of the the whole onboarding like they're going to be sharing their screen and and doing all this uh, from my experience at, at the company i work at these things are super insightful you start seeing a lot of the assumptions you have when you build things. Yeah. And it's, it, yeah. it can be very productive. I would, I would say in my experience, it's, it's best. I know it's hardest, but it's best if you can do it in person. Cause there's a lot you'll miss yeah. if you can't. That is true. Otherwise uh, I think it's best if you can get a video. So I did some testing way back in the day and uh, some companies would ask for a, a video like actually record your screen and your microphone as you experience the product and just be very talkative Hopefully, um, yeah. and some of the some of the feedback i got from those was also very insightful it was almost like mm -hmm. it was the next best thing to meeting somebody in person so somebody said on the chat that they will have a meeting to set up to onboard a new person today and uh, not today this week that will take notes. If you can record it, that would be even cooler, but make sure you ask their permission. But yeah, notes are uh, at least the that audio. Great. That's a great idea. I look forward to what you have to, what you have to say. Yeah, that's something we probably, I don't think we've ever done, which is pretty wild. I mean, we have like, we have feedback. We get through a Google form every now and then, but like, <laughs> real yeah every trade completed you you get shown the, the link right yeah either that i think it's the first one i don't know if it's every trade but maybe it is every yeah trade. like i think you get the dialogue and then you can dismiss it forever okay okay yeah because i know i don't dismiss any dialogues uh, i mean i don't hide them forever because i want to read them later and i get every time i complete a trade so for mr shill in the chat I agree with you. Video might be an, an issue with privacy, but maybe audio, if they are very vocal about it, at least their questions, it's very interesting to hear. Well, if it's in English, right? So, yeah, it's a, I don't know, in Filipino or some language that very few people in this community understand. So, okay, English. Yeah. If you could ask him if you could record the voice, you can modulate it later so we completely erase the traces of him. Or you could even keep it for yourself and just share the insights with us. Yeah, that might be that might be good enough. Whatever you're comfortable with. But yeah. I would say one thing coming out of this call that we should do more often, or at least try to do a little bit more in the next few weeks, is just observing users. I think I think we could learn a lot from that. That might even help inform growth strategy and how to approach people. Uh, yeah, for that. So, okay, cool. So any, any, any concrete points. things that we want to do for the, for the website in the short term? Shall we experiment with the different landing pages and having a, a list of content that we want to tackle that we think would be uh, media worthy or somebody would share it? I think that so, would be a starting point. So landing page, yeah. What was the other item? List of content? Yeah, so like like you said, that we should write more blog posts and oh, have more okay. videos. Yeah. Like we would create a, a, how do you say that? Uh, a schedule of what we plan on approaching. And then we, we go around trying to, to build those pieces of content and get them out. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can start with a short list of, I don't know, three items or whatever, five items and see how they do. Um, are you aware, is there a tool that, that you can use to uh, 
to experiment with landing pages or do you just kind of put them up? Yeah, there are many, there are many, but I think in our case, we can just do something simple. Like, because we use Jekyll, I don't think these tools, like there is a tool I think everybody in marketing uses called Unbounce. Okay. Where essentially you design variations of a page and then it does all the split testing and so on. Mm -hmm. But I think for our website, because it is such a simple website, it is easier for us to just create a new page and redirect the home page to it for like two weeks and see how it goes. Because we have tracking on the from Matomo, we can easily uh, split that traffic between like landing page equals the, the current home page versus landing page equals the other home page and and compare the conversion rates of that be conversion rate being somebody downloading the software from that point on we have no way to track it right okay do you think it makes sense to do that before optimizing the software itself or i mean i guess the software optimization is kind of going to be a process that happens over time is there any uh i think these are two separate things so we could do them independently okay. because like because we can't really make the link the full link of visitor to the website trader active in the platform we just see it as two separate things true okay yeah, we're never going to be able to do this link unless we want to sacrifice privacy and, and data ownership. Right, right, okay. Okay, so yeah, that sounds good. We can uh, experiment with a new landing page and some, uh, some new content, some new blog posts and some new videos. If you would like to be involved with creating these or, or, or putting forth these efforts, Join us in the growth channel on Keybase and we'll talk more about that there. Yeah, and I think even if people want to have content that's specific to their country, like, I don't know, I know that in Brazil, people have very, a lot of questions regarding the, the new regulations that you need to, to tell the taxman basically everything. Like we could potentially write about that. I don't live there anymore. I don't follow these things closely, but we could have localized stuff given that we have a website in a given language, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the benefits of having, uh, or at least one of the benefits that we had intended with having uh, translated pages was having lo region or locale specific content there too. Mm -hmm. Which I don't think we have, like I think even with, um, even with this, uh, the languages that are there now, I don't think payment methods are really tailored. Like in the, the frequently asked questions, for example, I see the comment, I mentioned Paxful because I know about how it is the most successful. Yeah, the gift card would be a really cool addition. Uh, yeah. Have just, you, have anybody here listened to the latest Tales from the Crypt? with a guy who did some uh, analysis on Paxful and he went calling the traders there. I think it's the, the, the very latest one, if not one before it. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing, the, the stories, read the article, yeah. Interesting, I have not heard that. So the big question is, why did the guy use only Paxful and local Bitcoins if BISC also has a data API? You know, that's one of the things of making us pub, uh, making publicity easier is like having stuff that reporters can pick up from. Cool. Okay. So that's funnel and software. I think we have some pretty good action items for that in the short term. Anybody have anything to add? I think publicity should be a little bit less complicated. 
Yeah, well, there is the typical conferences, the podcasts. By the way, podcasts, how did you and Wiz get, did you get invited to Tales from the Crypt and Stefan or did you approach them? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, Wiz knew Stefan, I believe. And then Tales from the Crypt, I believe. I know Matt is a big fan of this. He talks about it a lot. And I mm -hmm. think we also reached out there too. Um, I know that in the past, there are some podcasts that we have been invited to. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really a mix. I think, uh, like I said at the beginning of the call, I don't know if you were here, Fabio, but I, I was holding off a little bit on, on pushing growth too hard this year before mm -hmm. signing was, uh, or um, scanning yeah, exactly. and um, stuff. So um, uh, in the time we did have a couple of invites and since then we pushed a little bit harder and just kind of reached out as well. And so I think going forward, we'll, prob we'll probably reach out a little bit more and be more proactive about that. Um, especially since the project now just seems to have pretty good recognition in just in Bitcoin. Uh, when you reach mm -hmm. out and you say, hey, yeah, I'm from BISC, and most of the time they're, you know, willing to listen and possibly do something. We can kind of pick and choose where we think exposure is, is best for the project. There's somebody who sent a question here. Let's make sure we answer. Is there any feedback available from users who have downloaded BISC but not used the software? Well, we know they exist. <laughs> we, we don't really have a yeah. way to collect this feedback. It's only anecdotal evidence. But it's a good People question. I think that's the kind of feedback that I would like to get from people, like from like live feedback sessions. Like yeah, from the, the guys that I know that told me that, they say that they, they just installed it and they never got curious to use it because they were pretty comfortable with their uh, centralized exchange fashion. Mm -hmm. And in Brazil, we saw a big uptick in people using this because of the, like in September was the first month that people had to report, basically tell the, the IRS everything. And every crypto transaction you have, you need to tell uh, your social security number, your address, which address you're sending to, the social security number of the person, the amount in crypto, the amount in fiat, basically everything. So a lot of people went into these more self-owned things that you have to do your own reporting mm -hmm. because they didn't want the exchanges doing that for them. Yeah, that'll, that'll so, do it. And a lot of people only started using after something like that happens. Yeah. Uh, any complaints on the forums? No, I, I think they only go on the forums where, when they're more engaged. So when they have an actual problem using it and not downloaded didn't have problems there's even a cohort of people who download have problems opening it and then they go on github to send a ticket yeah he has a meeting for who, who, who wrote this uh ah, okay so this was because we were talking about the the other thing So we got a bit derailed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's much to talk about. Publicity is kind of opportunistic. And I think the, I guess the, we already talked about videos and blogging. Uh, I guess subtitles mm -hmm. is something worth mentioning if you're in a, uh, or if, you're, if you can translate uh, some of the existing videos, some of the more, you know, popular, more watched videos to another language. That's another thing that you could do to help out. Um, it's just a relatively easy way to get, you know, to um, uh, make a piece of content available to another, another market. Yeah, and also, um, I remember, oh, that's the name of the Polish guy I was trying to remember, Bernard. Lam, uh, Bernard. Forgot his but last he, name. He contributes to um to BTC Pay. No, no, no. He we were discussing in in Riga. 
we're discussing exactly that. And I remember I saw some, I don't remember if it was a commit or a pull request, but basically he said that he needed the API up so he could work. And that's still the case. Like the, there is no oh, API yeah, yeah, yeah. to do yeah. anything programmatically. So right. the API is the only uh, elegant way of doing that. Of course, you can always hack it around by having a Python clicker and do those things by guessing where the pixels are in the screen, but that's not really advisable. Yeah, not when you're handling money, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Very big chance of fucking up. Yeah. No, but uh, I think the API is uh, being worked on pretty actively right now. If you go to the gRPC API channel in, on Keybase, it's hopefully, hopefully getting somewhere now. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants it pretty bad, so hopefully it'll hopefully it'll be, it'll be out soon. But does anybody have any feedback on the subtitles? Like, do people actually use them? Because that's some, not something you can actually see on YouTube analytics, as far as I remember. That's a good question. I think the, the way I've seen it done lately is, uh, so this one guy, Kiss Bitcoin, has a video that he's translated now into or gotten translated into I think five languages and he just mm -hmm. when he tweets the video he just like lists the languages in which it's available mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that helps I don't know what the numbers are what he's what he's seen kind of viewership I know that on YouTube if you put a transcript of the video it can auto translate using Google Translate mm -hmm. which is a start oh. like it's a start to have all languages from the get-go okay but still that's it is always better to have a properly translated not machine translate but it is a start i wonder if you can add a uh a url argument that that specifies the language that you want subtitles to uh, not on on youtube itself but on embeds yes hmm, okay at least it was like that. I remember I, I wanted to do exactly that. Mm. Like two, three years ago when I was working for, for another company and mm. we had a video in English that we had subtitles in Portuguese. And that was the way we found to put it in the blog. It was to, to use an embed and pass in a parameter through the embed. Okay. Um, but still, uh, conferences. I remember that we we had Bernard talk in the in the panel at Baltic Honey Badger. Yeah. And then we have meetups where people just show up and, and talk about this. Like I did one here, Bernard did one in Poland. There there's people doing them all around. Should we have a list of target conferences that we would really like to be in? And so we prepare content for them and we try to talk to the organizers to get this on the stage? I think it's a good idea. I think having a list of conferences uh, in advance would be good. These guys tend to plan pretty, pretty far in advance, especially the bigger ones. So having a good idea in, in advance could be good. I would say for content, that's hard to do because at least in my experience, you don't know exactly what, what you're gonna be talking about until you're confirmed to attend and and then like if you're on a panel, the topic can vary. If you're doing a presentation, then I guess usually you can pick the topic. Yeah. But I think, um, yeah, it's hard to plan the, the content ahead unless. Yeah, but it, it is something that we can strategize for. So for example, uh, if we can start collecting stories like the, the guy who did the, the PAXs, uh, analysis or I don't know uh, Chris Beam's first talk in Hackers Congress which is which was how to bootstrap a DAO I think yeah which is very specific about one aspect of this I think that's more that's more specific and more likely to get us accepted because when we just talk about BISC in general there's pretty good awareness of what BISC is and nobody's yeah. really interested in knowing the basics. 
Right, right. Yeah, so maybe having a repository of ideas and talking points and pieces that people can put together for whatever it is they decide to, to present could be mm -hmm. helpful. Hmm. I'm wondering the best way to do that without getting it buried in a Google Doc. If we can maybe make a, maybe we can make one well, issue in, in the growth repository dedicated to conferences. Why don't we add a markup file, uh, a markdown file to, to the repository instead of an issue? We add the markdown file mm -hmm. as the conferences we, no, not the conferences, sorry, the topics. Because right now it is a repository. There is a README and it's empty, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, and then we basically use the issues. Yeah, there's a bit. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's effectively empty. Yeah. So we could use that. The only issue with that is if someone wants to offer an idea, then they have to like go through the whole pull request process as opposed to just adding a bullet point. Yes, that is true. That is very true. So I'm wondering uh, if we can have a link to the Google Docs there. <laughs> ah, that's not bad. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> We could do that. Yeah, well, okay. So somebody is, Mr. Swain again, sent a question. Is there a budget to do test marketing? If a Twitter account from US, UK, Brazil with 50K followers says they're used Fisk a few times, the traffic might pick up. Just curate the content to be helpful. Well, this is one of the ideas by having the content uh, readily available. But the, the problem of, uh, but when you say budget, what do you mean exactly? Do you mean to pay the, the Twitter account? So like the content producer who talks about Fisk? Yes. Hmm. Well, yeah, I don't know so about that. that. Goes back into the referral thing. It, it's, the logistics of it becomes very tricky because, for example, either the, the person goes in and asks for a compensation request or one of us becomes responsible for that and asks for compensation requests or reimbursement. And what if it gets denied? Yeah, plus it's, I don't know. It, I don't know if I like the idea of like paying for... Yeah. Yeah, paying, yeah, for, yeah paying for exposure that way, I don't know. It's a bit questionable. I would prefer to see people just, as they are right now, just like talk about this because they want to. Yeah, it would be, I, I come from a media background. So I think it would be cool to buy media on behalf of BISC and have very specific placements. But that easily becomes a nightmare in how you pay that. How do you report back, back to the DAO? where this money was spent like it's it's very tricky and i think we we could well we should focus way more on these ways to like this is not to grow hack it but to find other levers that we can pull rather than the, the traditional let's buy media let's pay for exposure yeah i would i would err on the side of encouraging like finding ways to spark conversation and spark word of mouth as much yeah. as possible through content through, you know, I think, I think paid, paid media could have a place. So like this morning we were talking about, um, with Wiz, we were discussing a, uh, so having a possibly having a booth or a table at Bitcoin 2020 and, you mm -hmm. know, just having a, a good spot there that people can just walk up to us and talk. And maybe by that mm -hmm. time we'll have the Android app done so we could just show them right there, the BISC experience in the palm of their hand, and like really connecting with people like that. I think that, you know, that, that might have a place. I think that could be very yeah. effective. Um, but when it comes to like, yeah, that was the idea of the conferences. It's like, there are conferences that we might not even talk with having people present. Like you remember how it was in the hackers Congress. We, right. So for those who weren't there, we, I was going to Hackers Congress, Steve was going there, and then we found, I think, two other people who were, 
and we created a small Slack channel, just the four or five of us. And we said, hey, let's meet up after the, the last uh, lecture and go for, for dinner together. And then I find somebody, I think I, I don't remember who I met on the way to the exit, that they said, yeah, yeah, the BISC people are all over there. And then we get into a room where there's like 17 people who heard about it and they were just meeting up because they, they were contributors or they are still contributors or they, they've used the, the platform and they like it. And we just went out for dinner with everybody. It was 17 people, right? Steve or yeah, it was something. It was crazy. It was around fifteen or seventeen people. It was great. Yeah, so being present in the conferences, even if you don't talk, like at the stage, there is a lot of value to it in community community building and you know meeting other people who you usually just see as an avatar from GitHub or right Keybase. Yeah. Cool. All right. So sounds like we have a couple of couple of things we can do coming out of the call. Do a, a new landing page for the website. Do a couple of new pieces of content to see, uh, to gauge what kind of originality we can come up with and how far it goes. Do, um, oh, do a list of conferences that we want to target for 2020 yeah Bobby, yeah I wrote for that. summary of three uh, like I can certainly help on the the first one like I still need to to do some things for the the support project that I I signed up for which is lagging on my side but that one I can certainly help and the list of conferences can pitch some ideas as well and I plan on attending a few but I, I'm pretty sure we can kickstart this and everybody can pitch in yeah sounds good we'll probably talk about most of the stuff in growth so follow yeah. that channel if you'd like to if you'd like to follow along anything else Anybody that's muted that wants to say some nice words at the end of the call? Wait a few seconds for folks to type or unmute. Okay. If that's it, then. Cool. All right. See yeah. you guys on Keybase. Yeah. Thanks for joining. And, uh, See you guys on Keybase. Cheers. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.